if Trump were to become president. I think that's pretty bearish for the energy complex in general, and that fits a historical pattern, given the inelasticity of demand for primary commodities. Um, when Democrats are in charge, that tends to make it more difficult to bring new supply online. And given the sensitivity to price, uh, to supply demand imbalances in the commodity sector, generally speaking, the commodity companies make way more money during Democratic presidencies than during Republican presidencies. So if, if two thirds or three quarters of that delta is due to geopolitics, then you would say that the geopolitical risk premium is somewhere in that 20 to $25 a barrel um, range. But gold is slowly becoming a it's slowly returning to what many believe is its rightful role as the neutral reserve asset for the settlement of international trade imbalances, which has historically been you know, since the 1970s, U.S. Treasury. I think the G7 countries are increasingly being boxed in. We are led by rather unserious, the, probably the most unserious suite of leaders the G7 has ever experienced. The Middle East is probably the biggest powder keg. Um, contrary to what people believe in the West, I think Putin is relatively cautious and um, is more concerned about his rightward flank than his leftward flank. But in Israel, we have a different situation. You know, 80 year olds that we have in the Senate and the House and, and in the White House need to go. Um, they need to exit stage left. Uh, we need to see the next generation. Um, the U.S. is blessed with. I mean, I don't want to sound like Peter Zihan, um, but let me do my best Peter Zihan impersonation. Uh, we're an energy gigapower. Mr. Doomberg, the green chicken. It's a pleasure having you on again, my friend. Danny, great to be back. You know, what, what better way to end the week than uh, a fun conversation with you? And 88% of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. Uh, if you don't mind doing me a favor, uh, just hitting that subscribe button takes less than a second. Um, and it's free. So if you don't mind, if you're getting value out of this content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Okay, Doomberg, let's go ahead and dive right in. What is your overview of the economy at the moment? Your uh, 30,000 foot view, let's say. I would say that um, it depends in which part of the world you're looking at, of course. I think Europe is uh, struggling and is uh, sort of dealing with electoral rebellions. Um, we saw the so-called um, landslide victory by Labour in the UK, which is interesting because they got two thirds of the seats in Parliament with one third of the votes. And this is sort of a classic first past the post parliamentary system, but that's more of um, a peculiarity of the UK um, parliamentary system than anything else. But in the rest of Europe, we're seeing this continued shift to the right and also um, sort of economic struggles, particularly in Germany. Uh, we don't think those things are unrelated. I think the war in Ukraine is not going well for NATO and for the West, and that is also putting some geopolitical pressure uh, on things. And of course, we have the highly uncertain, really preposterous situation in the U.S. Um, in the post-presidential debate era, where everybody is sort of looking at each other and wondering what's going to happen next. And Lord only knows what headlines will fall between the time when you and I record this conversation today and when it ultimately gets published or listened to by your audience. And so um, overall, I think the world is in a bit of a holding pattern, um, waiting, waiting to see whether the war in the Middle East flares up, whether we see some resolution in Ukraine, whether the U.S. economy ultimately slips into a recession, or frankly, whether the U.S. can pull off some semblance of a reasonable election that most people feel is a reasonably just outcome. Um, and so it, it's, it's a pr pretty historic time. It's, it's in many ways a baffling time, um, but it, it, of course those two things combine to make it a very interesting time um, and leave no shortage of interesting things for us to write about, to be sure. Let's stick with the election for a second. Uh, what are the paths taken between a President Trump or a President Biden or slash any insert Democrat, whether it be Gavin Newsom, Kamala Harris, if they remove Biden um, and put a, another Democrat in his place, what would be the main difference do you see regarding the economy, regarding geopolitics, et cetera? So I would say, ironically, if Trump were to become president, I think that's pretty bearish for 
the energy complex in general, and that fits a historical pattern, given the inelasticity of demand for primary commodities. Um, when Democrats are in charge, that tends to make it more difficult to bring new supply online. And given the sensitivity to price, um, to supply demand imbalances in the commodity sector, generally speaking, the commodity companies make way more money during Democratic presidencies than during Republican presidencies. Additionally, um, it would seem, based on his public pronunciations, that Trump is far more willing to, quote, cut a deal. You know, Trump is Mr. Deal. Uh, cut a deal with Putin, cut a deal with China, uh, end the war in the Middle East, as he says it rather flippantly. But broadly speaking, peace is also bearish for the energy complex. I think there's undeniably a significant geopolitical risk premium embedded within the current price of oil, at least compared to the other primary energy feedstocks. And so both of those developments, um, when combined, I think would see oil drop relatively precipitously from its current level. Um, and I, I, if you want to talk about the specifics of the election, um, I, I don't know how Biden remains on the ticket, and I don't know how they get him off the ticket. And so that's quite the conundrum that they have um, painted for themselves. Uh, and what, so it is a truly amazing time. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to say, what is the premium to oil now, given the, all of these risks sure. of World War III? So there's a lot of ways to, to estimate that. There's no way to say it definitively. Our preferred approach is to take the landed price of LNG in Europe and multiply it by 5.6, because in Europe, a lot of oil is burned to produce electricity, and that's the primary one of the primary uses of gas as well. And so there's enough sort of swappability that those two should sell for relatively the same price on an energy content basis. Um, there's roughly 5.6 million BTUs in a barrel of oil, and so you take LNG prices and multiply by 5.6, and you get roughly the oil equivalent price of natural gas. And when we do that today, we get about $56 a barrel for landed LNG with you know, WTI at 83 and change and Brent a few dollars higher. And so the, you know, if, if two thirds or three quarters of that Delta is due to geopolitics, then you would say that the geopolitical risk premium is somewhere in that 20 to $25 a barrel um, range. Now, of course, if the proverbial, you know, what hits the fan, then oil will spike a lot higher than that. This is sort of a risk adjusted risk premium, i.e. expected value probability of World War III times the consequences. Um, and in our view, a 20 to $25 risk premium for oil probably discounts World War III substantially because if things were to truly get out of control, I don't think $150 or $200 a barrel of oil is, is off the table. Um, but on an energy equivalent basis, if peace were to break out, oil would be trading in the mid-50s is our base view. Of course, we could be wrong. Um, we could be missing something important, but that is the way we look at the world um, over here. Could you say the same thing about the price of gold and silver? Well, the price of gold and silver are not energy related. Um, silver, tangentially so, I suppose, because of the demand for it in the solar sector. Well, well I mean, I mean, as like a crisis hedge, like is the yeah. price of gold kind of acting like a crisis hedge for a world war? Uh, no, I, I view the price of gold differently, and I, I take this from the Luke Roman School of uh, Macroeconomics. Um, for those that don't know Luke's work, um, Force for the Trees, it's a great newsletter that comes out every Friday um, that I read as soon as I get it. Um, the the U.S. Treasury, you know, U.S. Treasuries are being replaced as the neutral reserve asset in international trade by gold is his view, and it's one that we subscribe to. Um, and in order for that to happen, the U.S. dollar price of gold needs to be meaningfully higher than it is today. Um I don't think gold is necessarily a crisis hedge because um, when everyone is selling, you sell what you can sell and gold tends to be very liquid. So we saw during COVID, for example, that the price of gold in the early days took a beating like everything else, because in a time of crisis, you sell what you can, not what you want to. Um, but gold is slowly becoming a slowly returning to what many believe is its rightful role as the neutral reserve asset for the settlement of international trade imbalances, which has historically been you know, since the 1970s, U.S. Treasuries and to a lesser extent, uh, other Western debt. But in the aftermath of the imposition of, of first the freezing of Russia's foreign reserves and now at least the partial 
confiscation of them in the form of using the interest on those assets to, I don't know, be collateral for some loan that we're going to give to Ukraine that nobody expects they'll ever repay. Um, the, G, the G7 is still in a sort of old school foreign reserve system, but the BRICS and the rest of the global south seem to be moving towards a world where um, they trade with each other in their own domestic currencies and settle any imbalances net of that trade in gold. And the real driver of the recent upward trend in the price of gold is this physical gold exchange window in Shanghai and the fact that at that window, gold is trading for a significant premium to uh, the paper price of gold in London and New York. And um, as we're recording this today, it's around $23, $24 an ounce. And that means you can um, you know, short uh, gold in London and stand for delivery and then, uh, so you, you buy gold in London, stand for delivery, short gold in Shanghai, and and take the gold from London to Shanghai and pocket that delta, which has the net effect of of bringing physical gold out of the vaults in the West towards the East, which is what we're seeing in the numbers, even if those numbers aren't really believed. Um, those numbers are probably not believed because many think they're too small. But the trend is very clear. Gold is leaving the West, going to the East. A persistent premium for the price of gold exists in Shanghai. And that premium, that steady premium, is putting upward pressure on the price of gold, which seems to be um, having the effect that we can all see. I, I should complete my answer by saying that even though I personally own and other members of the Dubenberg team own substantial amounts of gold, it is the one asset that I own that doesn't make me feel good when it goes up too fast, because it usually implies some other major change, uh, some upheaval uh, is occurring in society, and uh, I would rather not see that. Yeah. What is kind of like your current take on the current state of geopolitics at the moment? You've got multiple theaters of war. Give us kind of like your overview of the geopolitical uh, world. Uh, I think the G7 countries are increasingly being boxed in. We are led by rather unserious, the, probably the most unserious suite of leaders that the G7 has ever experienced. Obviously, Biden has undergone substantial cognitive decline, which I think was evident to most free-thinking people for a very long time, and it certainly was evident to the other leaders of the world, including our quote-unquote geopolitical adversaries. I think we're losing the war in Ukraine. I, I think that's pretty undeniable. My great fear is what is the response of NATO to a clear loss to Vladimir Putin. Um, con concurrent with that loss in Ukraine, I think Putin has... Um, done a much better job than the G7 at selling his vision of a multipolar world to the global south than the G7 has, which seems to say you can have some solar panels, but otherwise don't develop, um, whereas Putin is selling them a much more amenable message to their national goals. And the only place you have to, to go to see the effect of those two different sales pitches is in India, where Modi has clearly aligned with Putin and the West seems to have lost India um, in this regard. I think the Middle East is probably the biggest powder keg. Um, contrary to what people believe in the West, I think Putin is relatively cautious and um, is more concerned about his rightward flank than his leftward flank. But in Israel, we have a different situation. Obviously, October 7th was a dastardly affair, but how the follow-up events have been handled is open to much debate. And here again, I think the G7 is in the minority globally. Whatever your views are on the Israeli-Palestine conflict, I think it is undeniable that if you do a roll call of countries at the United Nations, um, the United States and Israel are in the minority, and the world is quite frustrated with the developments um, in, in the Gaza. And if this war were to expand to um, Lebanon, and which would effectively be the slightest uh, distinction between a full-blown war with Iran, which we think it would very quickly um, devolve to, um, that would be a true catastrophe given the energy epicenter that the Middle East is. And then lastly, um, we have the situation in China and Taiwan um, and the Philippine Sea, um, which again is another powder keg. Um, it, it, it is truly probably, um, you know, without being cliche, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis comes to mind when you think about sort of the distance between where we are today and the sort of the, the midnight on the uh, Armageddon clock. But the big difference between the Cuban Missile Crisis and today is that back then, at least it made front page news, like nobody's even talking about it. Um, we're firing attack missiles into, you know, pre-2014 Russian borders, um, which can only be done 
with direct U.S. Um, help, which is a huge red line um, that would would be would have been unthinkable. Um, and we're doing it with nary a mention uh, in, in the uh, on the news, uh, on the television, or in the major papers. It's it's truly an incredible and and frankly a quite quite a scary time. Yeah, yeah. Often a point of debate, Doomberg, is whether this is intentional subterfuge or whether it's incompetence uh, from from our leaders. Uh, sometimes the decisions just appear so stupid that you can't help but ponder whether or not it's intentional or not. What's kind of your opinion on the matter? Boy, it's a question we struggle with a lot. That goes without saying. Um, having been in the sort of reasonably upper echelon of the corporate world for several years, I can only tell you that um, for a long time before I reached sort of the board level of a you know Fortune 50 type company, um, I always assumed that there was some oracle behind the next door that understood everything and, and I was missing some critical piece of information. And I'm, I remember when I finally got to attend my first board meeting, the, the, the shock that I felt when I realized that there was no there there. They're deeply ordinary people living in bubbles, surrounded by yes people. Um, they put pants on in the morning, just like you and me, and they're, they don't have access to anything special or differentiating that would give them some unique insight that we're missing. They're just that dumb. Um, and so if you pushed me, I would say it's a competency slash bubble slash um, sort of social pressure to hold the party line momentum that causes the seemingly dumb decisions and stances to persist long beyond their sell by date. And, um, and so I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to live in a world where this is some mischievous plan by the WEF to um, starve billions of people and cause global calamity because of the debt system. You know, like I, I just don't think a they're that sophisticated or B um, that's just plausible, but you know, uh, at this point, I suppose one one could be convinced to believe anything. What should be on the radar screen for the average investor, Doomberg, given all the turmoil, all the chaos, all the uncertainty out there? If you're a retail investor, where should your sensors be pointed to? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I, I if you if you set about looking for things to worry about, you'll find plenty of them: commercial real estate in the U.S. Um, you know, the banking system globally, uh, the obvious decline in the democratic norms of the Western world, the risk of World War III, um, all of those things are real and should be concerning, but not necessarily instructive for the future price of equities. You know, there's all manner of stimulus tricks that the U.S. Treasury and Federal Reserve and Congress can pull to inject liquidity into the economy and cause things like the NVIDIA stock bubble and, and other things that we see today. And so it can be very difficult for a retail investor who is, you know, not exactly playing with house money. Let's say that they, they have hard earned savings that they actually need for retirement. It's very difficult to, to give any reasonable you know, investment advice to, to such people. I, I We are very conservative. Um, we don't really play in the stock market. We earn in fiat and save with real assets like land and gold and invest privately where we can affect the outcome. But we recognize that not everybody has access to private deal flow, for example. So in our view, I think um, over the long run, it's best to get a decent financial advisor and listen to them. Um, the people that we know who have done that have done quite well. Um, yes, there's always a chance that there's a, some calamity, but then there's the counterpunch to the calamity. I'll, I'll finish my answer with one short anecdote. I remember during the peak of the COVID crisis, um, hovering over the buy button where I was going to put half of my retirement account in one company that I knew extremely well. Um, they had a bulletproof balance sheet. They were trading at a ridiculously low price. Um, I'll make up some numbers, but it'll be close. They were trading at $5 a share when I felt their balance sheet meant that the stock had a floor of $40 a share. And I hovered over the buy button and chickened out at the last minute. And sure enough, didn't it trade to 35 within a year? And if I had done that, um, I suppose perhaps Doomberg would not have been born because I could have retired. 
but nonetheless, it's impossible to time the markets. Um, you know, everybody says they buy at the low and sell at the high. Very few people do. And I think if you just sort of dollar cost average into the markets in a very conservative way over time, um, generally you'll be all right. Uh, much better than trying to time it. Hey guys, quick pause. Looking for the best gold and silver prices out there? Well, I have scoured all throughout the internet trying to find you guys the best prices and I, uh, Miles Franklin does it for me. In my opinion, I haven't really been able to find anything else that compares to their prices. Uh, you really don't want to. What you really want to do, however, is you want to email them at info at milesfranklin.com and you want to say that Capital Cosm sent me in the subject line because if you do that you'll get their special pricing guide that's some of the most competitive pricing out there no commitment necessary info at milesfranklin.com and capital Cosm sent me in the subject line and now let's get back to the video okay so you mentioned nvidia in your comment there let's go ahead and pull on that string for a second we have all of these ai data centers and they're using tons of energy now, if the economy's heading towards a recession or we're already in a recession and you've just got the lag effect in play where we're not going to know we're in a recession until after the fact, uh, will this AI play continue to expand out despite being so energy intensive or will it simply incentivize better forms of energy to come in play, i.e. nuclear? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the valuation of NVIDIA side, like I have no informed opinion on whether NVIDIA is worth $25 billion for every $1 of stock movement <laughs> that it currently, you know, uh, that's the current sort of level of market cap based on the whims of the market. Um, I think AI is very real. Um, I have dug into a fair bit of it, use it a lot, um, understand the weaknesses today, but can see the vector of uh, continuous improvement that is unfolding at incredible speed. And I do think what we've written, we wrote a piece last year, I believe, um, called Vision Chips, where we predicted that um, one of the ways to model the world is through this Kurzweilian lens that the economy will orient itself around doing whatever it needs to do to provide the, uh, t the total amount of energy the computing side of our economy needs, and we always seem to. And that's... Um, that's an axiom that we have pondered a lot and are thinking about a follow-up piece because basically what this means is a lot of people are going to be priced out of the electricity market. So what is electricity worth? Electricity is worth way more than we pay for it. It's a, it's a public good that is heavily subsidized. Um, it's not 12 or 15 or 20 cents a kilowatt hour if you didn't have it. Uh, to the marginal buyer in a shortage, electricity is worth a hell of a lot more than that. And AI is going to crowd a bunch of poor people out. And it's going to get ugly, in our view. They won't be denied. Um, the time to bring nuclear to market is inconsistent with the pace of increasing demand of AI. I do think in the long term, AI normalizes the need for SMRs and so on in a rapid build-out. But in the meantime, we're going to see, as we've seen in Texas, for example, um, we have natural gas trading for negative prices in the Permian Basin today. They're going to take that natural gas, make electricity, and feed it to the AI compute um, stack. That's coming. Um, that's a, a much quicker proposition, um, even down at the mobile unit level, that it can be done. Um, they're going to crowd out Bitcoin miners and all of those other things. Um, so that's coming first. That's sort of the low-hanging fruit. But the real consequences of a 10, 20, 30% increase in demand on the U.S. electricity grid, which is in no way capable um, of... of meeting that incremental demand. Well, the only way you destroy demand is with price. AI can afford to pay that price. And um, the lower end of the economic scale can't. And, you know, in a way, um, it's a, it's a one-two punch. AI is going to take out a lot of white-collar jobs that uh, exist today. And then at the same time, it's also going to make everybody's energy bills go up a lot. And there's a, there's a model that one can sort of game out that um, leads to pretty significant social disruption beyond even what we're seeing today. Uh, we haven't quite formalized those thoughts to the point where we'd put them out in a piece, but that's sort of where our thinking is taking us already. Okay. Well, are there any opportunities you see out there right now? Um, as I know you're not into like, the, you're not into you guys don't go into deep into stocks, anything like that, but just in general, like any opportunities out there? Well, we like gold, um, not as an investment, of course, but as 
as a hedge against disaster slash a bet on the changing dynamics of the uh, international trade. Um, and we, we do like natural gas in the U.S. Um, we, we sort of called the bottom in natural gas when Henry Hub front month was around $1.50. You know, in, in the long run, um, natural gas and oil ultimately have to converge. And we have this byproduct economic situation in the Permian that is keeping natural gas uh, prices lower. But at $2.40 a million BTU today, that's the rough equivalent of $15 a barrel oil. And um, that which do the same thing cannot sell for different prices indefinitely. Um, and the jaws of arbitrage during a glut tend to sort of close down, which would be up for the, for the thing that's in excess supply and down for the, for oil, which in this case, um, you know, so what, what I'm saying is we're seeing a lot of engine switching um, to burn natural gas instead of diesel, for example, in long haul trucking, we're going to see increased demand for natural gas, as a consequence of the AI revolution, which we just mentioned. And so the cheapest hydrocarbon on the board is the one that's always interesting to me. And the cheapest hydrocarbon on the board um, globally um, is um, Permian natural gas, Albertan natural gas, to a lesser extent, um, Henry Hub and Appalachia, but they're all dirt cheap and um, super valuable clean burning molecules that produce an enormous amount of energy uh, aren't going to be dirt cheap forever. What about coal? Coal, um, coal and natural gas tend to move in somewhat of a sink. Uh, what do you think of coal? Yeah, landed LNG and coal tend to move in sync. You, you know, natural gas, because it's a gas, has regional gluts like we see in the U.S. Um, coal, um, interestingly, uh, we, we, of course, love it when the Energy Institute publishes the fiscal review of world energy every June. Um, it's like Christmas Day around here. Um, and we noted with interest that coal set a new record um, for consumption in 2023, which runs totally contrary to the decarbonization narrative that we have been fed. Um, I would say coal as a commodity is difficult to trade. Um, the coal producers tend to be available to be had for relatively low you know, P to E slash other valuation metrics, but at the same time, um, they, they can be difficult to make money in because you shouldn't expect that the market is suddenly going to give them an uplift in their valuation. And you really have to study management and what their shareholder remuneration plans are because ultimately um, dividends uh, is probably how you're going to make your money back if you invest in those companies. Um, there's a school of thought that the coal equities are today what the cigarette companies were 20 years ago. And if you had only invested in cigarette companies 20 years ago and reinvested all the dividends they paid, you would have handily beaten the S&P, which is probably true. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I think coal is here to stay. I think in 10 years, we'll be born, burning more coal than we're burning today. And in 20 years, we'll be burning more coal than we will be in 10 years. That's a bit of a contra opinion. Um, but I think um, Nothing in the data that we have seen uh, gives any indication otherwise. What are your thoughts on on Bitcoin and crypto at large? I, I personally haven't heard you speak on um, on crypto, but do you? What do you think about crypto? Uh, I would separate crypto from Bitcoin first of all, yeah. and I think um, most of crypto is sort of magic beans nonsense that will eventually go to zero. Um, greater fools slash. Uh, a bit of a Ponzi aspect to it. I think Bitcoin is different in the sense that Bitcoin has won the network effect game amongst the digital currencies. And enough people believe that there is a future value for Bitcoin that it can actually become self-fulfilling. Um, um, I, I, I think there are structural aspects to the Bitcoin market that, you know, scarcity, embedded scarcity and, and all of that stuff that do make it... Um, attractive to the same set of people that are interested in gold. So the overlap in the Venn diagram of people who own gold and Bitcoin is bigger than most gold bugs would like to admit. For example, they're both kind of viewed as um, fiat escape valves um, for the everyday person. Uh, whether or not you believe that's true um, is not relevant. Enough people believe it's true that it is relevant. Um, we don't own Bitcoin. Um, we have no particular strong feelings on it. Um, if I wake up tomorrow and Bitcoin is at 5,000 because all the Mt. Gox um, supply is back online and everyone is rushing to the fiat exits, 
that wouldn't surprise me. And if I wake up tomorrow and Bitcoin's at 500,000 because the U.S. is on the cusp of a hyperinflationary rate reset, that wouldn't surprise me either. Um, neither of those outcomes would trigger much in the way of emotion from me because I'm not involved in it. And generally speaking, when I'm not in a name, I don't really care what it does because I've made the decisions to allocate my own personal capital in the way that I have. And I'm comfortable with those decisions uh, given the so totality of the knowledge that I had when I when I made it. I can't invest in Bitcoin because I prefer to invest in private enterprise where I can tangibly see the source of the value creation and can even on occasion assist in creating it. That's I have no edge in Bitcoin. I, I hold gold because it has a 5,000 year track record of being an excellent preservation of value. I know that 20 gold eagles today buys a reasonably good midsize SUV. And in 20 years, I think 20 gold eagles will still buy a reasonably <laughs> good midsize SUV, which is the purpose of gold. Um, that's why I hold it. I don't invest in gold. I save in gold. I save in land. I, I don't view my net worth as being measured in US dollars. I view it as being measured in acres and ounces. Um, I, I, I transact in fiat, um, but, I, but I save in real assets. And if you think Bitcoin is a real asset and its scarcity design is, is going to make the number go up, then knock yourself out. I mean, I, I, many people believe that and some have done quite well. Um, but our view on Bitcoin is it's interesting, I understand it, and it's not for us. I want to peel back the layers of your philosophy, Doomberg, your investment philosophy, so to speak. If I were to give you a million dollars and you had to allocate it, you had to allocate that million dollars, broadly speak, I'm not asking like specific names or anything like that, but from a broad sense, how would you partition a million dollar portfolio given given today's conditions? So if a million dollars was all I had is different than if you gave me a million dollars to what I already have. Right. Um, so if, if you're asking me the former. Um, Let's go with that. The, uh, yeah. So if, if if all I had was my friends, my contacts and my cell phone and a million dollars, um, the first thing I would do is I would put six months of living expenses in the bank. The uh, second thing I would do is work to minimize my mini my living expenses to the maximum extent possible. And then the third thing I would do is um, take the rest of it and try to build a business uh, because I'm a private investor slash business builder, not a stock speculator. Um, so that would be seed capital for me to conceive of an idea, phone my friends, see if I can get some other investors to join me, um, bounce the ideas off them, and then put it to work and try to compound it myself. Um, I, I, I think far too few people see within themselves the potential to be their own compounder and instead are um, seeking to beat the market, which is exactly what sort of the citadels of the world wants you to believe is possible. Um, now, if, if you give a million dollars to somebody who already has, you know, reasonable accumulated sum, well, the incremental million dollars is a different thing than the only million dollars. And by the way, only million dollars, I mean, uh, who, who wouldn't want to start life with a great cell phone full of contacts and a million dollars in the bank. Um, but if, if you gave it to me, I would put six months of savings and then I would spend the next six months trying to build a great business that I could compound that original capital um, through my own hard work, sweat equity. You know, um, we have a, a saying around the Doomberg team, which is uh, wake up, show up, make the number go up. Um, and, you know, the harder we work, the more money we make. And, and everybody out there ought to try to put themselves in such a position where you write a great piece, you do a good podcast appearance, you get more subscribers, you get more likes, you get more clicks, you get more money. Um, and that's what Doomberg is for us. It's the product of our sweat equity. We spent very little developing Doomberg, and uh, at least in the way of money, but our time and effort and and you know love has got into this project. And that's what I would try to replicate. If you if you stuck me uh, in New York with nothing but a million dollars in my cell phone, I, I wouldn't be speculating in the stock market. I would be using it as seed capital to bet on myself to create a business that compounds. Are you still bullish on the United States, Doomberg? There's so yeah, much long, optimism. Yeah. yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, long term, absolutely. Look, I mean, um, we've toyed with writing that piece. Uh, it just feels wrong to write it right now, but maybe because it feels wrong, it's probably right. Um, the US wants this slate of terrible leaders, and this is a bipartisan indictment. Uh, the, you know, 80 year olds that we have in the Senate and the House and and then the White House need to go. Um, they need to exit stage left. Uh, we need to see the next generation um, 
the U.S. is blessed with, I mean, I don't want to sound like Peter Zihan, um, but let me do my best Peter Zihan impersonation. Uh, we're an energy gigapower. We produce 20% of the world's oil, 25% of the world's natural gas. We're a net exporter of coal. We have um, huge shale deposits that are off limits to development today for political reasons, like the Monterey Shale in California, just one example. We have 90 nuclear reactors churning out baseload electricity at a 92, 93% capacity factor. We have the world's best universities. We have deep water ports. We have an amazing river system. We have great farmland. We have fertilizer. We have chemicals. We have um, institutional memory of what great institutions used to be. Um, there's a few major changes that we need to embark upon, which includes a substantial culling of the size of the federal government, a return of power to local governments like states and counties. Um, we have some major problems in some of the big cities and in some of the coastal states. Um, we have a fentanyl crisis of epic proportion. Um, we have a failing educational system. There's lots of reasons to be down, but there's a reason why the flow of immigrants is in one direction. It's a check valve. I mean, everybody's trying to get in and very few people with the rare, you know, high profile exception are trying to get out. Um, and if you drew a circle around Mexico, Canada, and the U S you have, uh, and then of course, if you extended it and sort of the Monroe doctrine down to, um, central and Latin America, um, we have all we need over here. We don't need to be entangled in foreign wars. Um, we have a bounty of excess energy food. Um, we have a traditions that can be restored. Um, I think once the fourth turning is over, the rebirth will be worth living. I hope to see both me and my family and the Doomberg team through that fourth turning. But um, deep down, we're pretty optimistic. Uh, this too shall pass. Um, the U.S. Has, has seen a lot in its you know, 248 years. It seems pretty grim right now. Uh, and it might still get grimmer. But um, ultimately, yes, I, I, I am personally and we as a team are, are reasonably optimistic in the medium to long term. How, how do you deal with the debt crisis in the United States, though? You've got the tri 30 tr trillion plus in sovereign debt. You've got the hundred some odd trillion in the unfunded liabilities. How do you get past that, though? A uh, temporary period of very high inflation that is a soft default is the traditional way. I don't think the U.S. is going to actually default and bring the whole system down. But um, that's the liability side of the balance sheet. As a nation, the U.S. has two, three, four times that in resources it could liquidate if it needed to. If you just think of the U.S. as sort of a, a company, um, we have, again, if you put Texas out to bid, what would you pay for Texas, right? I mean, it, it it's... If, if you put California out to bid and said, you know, we're going to liberate the resource development that's embedded there, like we have a lot underground that we're politically choosing not to develop. Um, we have a lot of, um, you know, just take the Doomberg business, for example, this is like a totally tiny, irrelevant, but yet I think applicable analogy, right? Um, we have a subscription business and that's interesting and valuable and we certainly enjoy it. But the value of the intellectual property 300 pieces later and the value of the network that we've created for ourselves 236,000 email subscribers most of whom work on wall street and have interacted many of them have interacted with us and you know what is the value how do you put a value on that on those intangibles for our business that we we like to say that um the subscription revenue is it's not the least valuable Part of our business but it's it's not necessarily the most valuable part of our business i would view the us in, in the same way um we have enormous intellectual horsepower amazing resources um and the potential to put ourselves in order uh, the us is is not i i was I choose my words carefully because i haven't thought about it in this way it's not clear to me that the us is bankrupt um because the assets that we have available and in the right crisis, our ability to put those assets to work should not be discounted. Um, you, you could sell the U.S. highway system to private equity and let them put tolls on it, and you can imagine what that system would be worth, right? <laughs> like, that's a controversial thing to say, but we have an awful lot of, uh, let's call it 
fully decapitalized assets that have a book value of zero in the some rather simplistic $30 trillion of debt and uh, running a deficit analysis. Um, and so I think recognizing that those assets are real and in a true emergency, we could break that glass um, is, is probably why we still see U.S. Treasuries at 5% or whatever they are, even though it looks to all outside observers that the U.S. is essentially indistinguishable from an emerging market, you know, debt spiral type economy. Um, it is different. Um, for a variety of reasons, and um, but the proper political leadership, which is admittedly lacking today, I, I do think that that value could be tapped. Sounds good, Doomberg. That's a that's a very good way to uh, kind of put a close to our podcast. Uh, I do ask a couple of questions before my guests leave, though, on every sure. show. Uh, the first question is: Are there any books or book that you want that you'd like to recommend to the audience to read? Boy, you know, I was I was telling you before we we started that I'm on a on a four day um, treadmill with these pieces, you know, and so I haven't really been reading all that much uh, in the way of books um, lately. So I know it's a bit of a, a cop out of an answer, but I don't want to just make one up. I, I haven't read a book in a while because I have to um, participate in the research, writing, editing, publishing, uh, promoting, and defending a piece every four days, and so that just is not amenable to. Um, to a good book re reading, but I would say the book um, behind you uh, and uh, to the right uh, is the, the Fourth Turning by Neil Howe, which I suppose is as good a book as any to read because I did manage to at least listen to a big chunk of that uh, while on a recent road trip, and I found it to be both um, scary and in inspiring uh, in the way that I just answered that question. So if you push me, uh, go ahead and buy Neil's book because he's uh, both a good guy and, and a very interesting thinker. Interesting. So we'll have that link down in the description box below, guys, if you're interested in buying that book. Uh, the second question that I ask my 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 guest is um, to leave a question for the next guest. So if there's a question that you'd like to ask the next guest, what would it be? Boy, um, do they see any path to peace in the war in Ukraine that does not involve direct kinetic conflict with NATO? Because if that such a path exists, I'd be very interested to learn of it. Okay. And the question that I got from the guest before you, which was Bob Moriarty, if you guys haven't seen that interview, um, I'll have that link down below as well, guys. Uh, here's what I'm going to say. I'm not smart enough to go one-on-one -on -one with Doomberg. Doomberg is simply brilliant. And rather than me introduce something to confuse him, what I want him to do is to talk. So if there's any topic you want to bring <laughs> up that has been brought up, the, the stage is yours. Uh, I would say that um, one of the things we need to do in the Western world is go back to basics and have a real understanding of the physics of energy. And the reason we need to do that is because our relative misunderstanding of the physics of energy have put much of the West in a geopolitical position of weakness. And military might is a derivative of industrial might, and industrial might is a derivative of getting energy policy correct. And the US has certainly done all right, but Europe in particular seems to have lost that lesson. And I, it's no coincidence, I think, that we're losing the war in Ukraine. Um, in part because Europe is so weak and Europe is weak because it has screwed up its energy policy. And so um, that's how I would um, answer his non-question. Okay. Well, Doomberg, it's been a pleasure. Uh, drop us your socials. Where can people find you? Yeah, everything is at uh, Doomberg.com. Um, and we're on Substack Notes. Um, and you'll find all of our pieces, our pro tier webinars, um, and also all of our podcast appearances like this one. Um, on the, the Doomcast uh, tab. So everything Doomberg is at doomberg.com. We managed to acquire that domain name recently, um, ejecting a, a squatter for a rather unfair price, but it had to be done. Um, I suppose the price of ejecting that squatter is testimony to the great run that we've had. Um, but yeah, we, we're now doomberg.com, um, newsletter.doomberg.com. If you Google Doomberg Substack, um, we're not active on Twitter. We are active on LinkedIn a little bit and perhaps growing, but find everything at, at doomberg.com. And Danny, it was uh, always great to speak with you. I um, hope you have a wonderful weekend and thanks again for having us on. Yeah, likewise.
And if you and if you guys enjoy this content, be sure to comment down below. Go Doomberg, go, go Doomberg, go. Also remember to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this content so we can continue getting guests like Doomberg on the show. And with that said, I will bid you adieu. Bye, y'all. Awesome.